it's good to see so many folks turning out this evening. To start with, I have, want to extend special thanks to the St. Helena Public Library for making these programs possible, and also to a, a wonderful organization here in town, the Friends and Foundation for the Library, a nonprofit that also makes these programs possible. So thanks to uh, both of them. When Louis, the 16th by that, nine, by that name in the uh, French monarchical lineage, ascended the throne in 1774, together with his queen, Marie Antoinette, France was in an enviable position. Even though France had lost the Seven Years' War uh, almost 20 years earlier to the English, France was still the unrivaled power on the European continent. And its ships were dominated, dominant on the seas, apart from the, the English control of the seas, but the French merchant marine and the French navy could hold their own. And France was outwardly and seemingly to all observers uh, never uh, as strong as it was in the mid-1770s as young Louis came to the throne. He was the latest in a long line of French sovereigns, going all the way back to Vincent Jetterix, who had been a challenge for Julius Caesar 2,000 years before in Caesar's effort to conquer the Gauls. Vincent Jetterix was one of the last to fall. When the Roman Empire declined in the West, a king named Clovis became the king of the Franks, which were a, a tribe that uh, succeeded the Gauls and actually ruled most of France and most of present-day Germany. The Franks were a real power, and a few hundred years later, there was the famous Charlemagne, uh, whom the Germans also claim as a national hero. Uh, Charlemagne, one of the most powerful monarchs of his age, around uh, 800 AD. And in most recent memory, there was the Sun King, Louis XIV, the man who had moved the capital from Paris to Versailles, a capital that he built from the ground up and forced all the, no, the French nobility to uh, attend upon the throne at Versailles. This was an effort not only to escape Paris, uh, but to hold the, the nobility close to the king so they wouldn't get into mischief. So he made sure that they had lots of parties and lots of very expensive entertainments and that they did not uh, think any rash thoughts about changing the monarchy. I put this slide up because there were rumblings beneath the surface of this wonderful picture of, of French dominance on the continent. And there's an argument that can be made that these three, along with some others, uh, were responsible for what followed in the two succeeding decades. There was a lot of, of ferment going on in the late 18th century as we were discussing last time when I spoke about the formation of the American government, the independence and the Constitution. And basically these inquiries, this questioning among learned men who thought deeply on these subjects came down to two questions. What is the nature of man and what is the role or purpose of government among men? You'll forgive me if I use the, the uh, male descriptive, uh, but women had relatively little influence and certainly the, the men were doing the writing and, and the acting at this time. 
Um, there were several different streams which, as I will try to explain later, even though the streams were necessarily contradictory, the French were able to keep two contradictory thoughts in their minds at the same time. The first was by this fellow Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a difficult man, a solitary man, uh, who came up with a, a number of theories about human activity and the nature of humanity, uh, which did not necessarily jive with reality, but seemed to be accepted broadly uh, by people. His great belief growing out of a completely uh, misappraised view of Indians in America was that there was such a concept as the noble savage. So in, in, our, in our, as humans, nascent state in, in uh, pre-civilization existence, uh, we were noble, we were benign, and uh, humans uh, had all good thoughts about other humans. We were not selfish, we were not grasping, um, and we were truly noble. It was civilization that undid this nobility. It was the perversion of civilization. It was all the, the layers of complexity uh, that caused this discontent and these things that caused humans to uh, attack each other. So Rousseau had this completely unrealistic view of the nature of humanity, which contrasts significantly with that 3,000 miles away in America, and also among thinkers like John Locke in England uh, a few years before which is a different view of, of humanity. And that was more espoused by the rationalists and the Enlightenment thinkers, uh, of which John Locke was one, of which René Diderot was another. Diderot was assembling a number of scholars to produce the Encyclopedia, uh, which is one of the hallmarks of, of the Enlightenment. Locke and Diderot and the other Enlightenment thinkers saw humans as uh, flawed, as noble in some respects, but easily uh, transformed into creatures subject to, to greed and to passion. And it was this greed and this passion that had to be offset and in some way controlled if a society was to be uh, properly run. And the, the, the rationalists thought long and hard about government and its role in society, and they also believed, as did Jefferson, that basically all men are created equal. This was an entirely different view than what was prevalent at the time among the aristocratic and noble uh, folks who were in charge of things. They saw uh, humans, human society as divided very sharply among those who were born to rule and those who were born to be ruled. Most people fell in this second category. And being born to rule was governed by one's birth. So if one had a noble lineage, an aristocratic lineage stretch, stretching back several generations and hopefully much more, one was born to rule and was given gifts of education and wealth that permitted that person to rule dispassionately on the basis of what is the good for all. Uh, whereas, as I say, the the uh, Enlightenment thinkers like Locke and Jefferson and Madison in our country um, and Diderot were arguing that man being this flawed character uh, with some nobility and some baseness 
had to be governed properly and the role of government was to set up a system whereby man's nobility could flourish and the tendencies toward uh, rascality, greed, passion could be controlled without the imposition of a, of a police state. So these were the two contrasting views. But what was happening at this time when there was such a ferment, an intellectual ferment at the court and among the better educated uh, uh, people in the countryside and, and in Paris at the time, as well as London, as well as America, uh, was this idea uh, that this rationality should, should prevail. Rousseau, on the other hand, also introduced another concept that became very, very popular, especially at the court, and it's contained in the French word sensibilité, or sensibility. Now, sensibility today doesn't mean what it did in the 18th century in, in, uh, in the French court. Sensibilité was a, uh, a great empathy, a great understanding of one's fellows. Uh, now, of course, one's fellows at court were one's fellow aristocrats and nobles. So it wasn't as if sensibilité embraced all of humanity. It was uh, sensitivity, it was empathy, and so the court for a while became, and the thinkers and, and some of the learned folks uh, throughout the rest of the country were overtaken with this idea, this warm, fuzzy idea of sensibilité, and it had some unfortunate consequences. It's hard to break down all the causes of the French Revolution, but I've outlined the, the basic causes here. The first was that on top of a fragile economic system came the cost of the American War, of, of uh, the enormous French aid to we Americans uh, in the late eight, uh, 1770s and, and early 1780s. And that cost was huge and was a real burden to the French, but they were able to cover it up for a while until they finally uh, could not escape it anymore. So, <coughs> pardon me, first the king brought in an advisor by the name of Necker, a Swiss, who instituted some reforms and, and also uh, urged, pleaded with the king and the court to adopt other reforms. Um, then he was dismissed after a while because his reforms were too radical. They were necessary, but the court couldn't see how they could, they could part with their privileges. So on top of the cost of this war in America uh, was the basic extravagance of the court, where thousands of, of uh, French livres, French pounds, thousands, tens of thousands would be spent on a, on a minor piece of, of jewelry uh, to grace uh, some lord or, or lady. Uh, there was the inequity of the tax system, whereby the, the uh, clergy and the nobles and the aristocrats paid very little, if any, taxes, and most of the taxes fell on what was called the third estate, the middle class, or even the peasantry in terms of, in, in the form of, of uh, payments in kind of crops. On top of that, there was tax farming, so the, the king would contract with certain individuals to collect taxes on his behalf. Now, there are a lot of inequities in that sort of a system because the natural tendency for the tax farmer was to, uh, he had a number that he, it was his quota, but if he could earn a little bit more on top of that quota by pressing the uh, poor taxpayer a little harder, uh, there was every incentive to do so. Uh, 
So the tax system was very inequitable. On top of this, there was a long-standing institution in France called Lettre de Cachet. Uh, Lettre de Cachet were issued by the king or his, his ministers and in effect could jail any person so named in the letter without cause, without spelling out any reason for doing so, uh, the troops would arrive at your door and hustle you off to jail and you had no knowledge of what the charge was or how long you would be there or if you'd even have a chance to stand before a magistrate and, and argue your case, which you didn't know. So there were a number of, of uh, evils, a number of uh, extreme uh, inadequacies in the formation of the French economy and the French government under the absolute monarchy of this time, and they soon became even more glaring. So after Necker was dismissed the first time, the king enlisted uh, a noble by the name of Calon to undertake uh, the, the task of reform, and he proposed some of the same things that Necker proposed, and he proposed some other new things, and he, again, in the long run, was very frustrated because the aristocracy, the nobility, and the aristos were simply unwilling to part with their privileges, including very light, if any, taxation, and the many privileges they had in, uh, in uh, the way of transportation, in the ease of homes, and, and, and uh, everything like that. Uh, so the, the king recalled Necker at just about the time uh, the revolution was about to, to commence. Another factor that, that uh, seems perhaps a little frivolous but cannot be dismissed, and that is the role of the Palais Royal. The Palais Royal is a building that's still extant in, in Paris on uh, uh, Faubourg uh, Saint-Honoré and was a beautiful, large city mansion basically controlled and owned by the uh, Duc de Orléans, which was a long lineage, a long, the Orléans family went back hundreds of, of years and was somewhat of a rival to the Bourbons. The Bourbon lineage was currently the, the family in, uh, that sired the kings, and Louis XVI was a Bourbon. The Duc de Orléans had this massive uh, residence in the center of Paris, and it was, we would term it a shopping center today. It was an extraordinary place. It was his residence, it, he had beautiful gardens, the, the current Duc d'Orléans had gorgeous gardens, beautiful promenades and walks or in, in this great courtyard uh, in the interior of, of Palais Royal, but also at, at street level and below, in, in subterranean levels, there were boutiques, there were bookshops, there were coffee shops, um, there were prostitutes galore. Um, for a young man on the town who was looking for intellectual and other pleasures, Palais Royal was the place to go. It was a, also a ferment of conversation, of agitation on all these issues of, of the day, like the instability of the French economy and the rights of man and the inequities of Lettre de Cachet. All of these things were grist for this uh, constantly churning mill of ferment and discussion and everything that was going on within the Palais Royal. With all this difficulty going on in terms of the French economy and the falling uh, level of, of taxation, the falling revenue, the greater demand for expense, uh, the rising level of expenses, the king was being advised to call the Estates General. Now, this is another uh, interesting aspect of the French form of government. The Estates General were, was a threefold institution. The first estate was the clergy, mostly the bishops, but 
in fact, in, in theory, embracing also the common priest, uh, the parish priest in the village. So the first estate were the clergy. The second estate was the nobility. The third estate was everybody else, principally the bourgeoisie, the growing middle class, and, and below the three estates were the peasantry, the, the people working the farms, uh, being abused by the tax farmer, uh, being abused by the local soldiery, uh, a, a terrible burden. Um, but basically these three estates would come together as the estates general uh, to advise the king. The last one had been called in 1614, more than a hundred years before the 1780s. So it had not been convoked in all that time, and Louis was besieged with uh, urgings that the Estates General be called, and uh, Necker and Calonne and all, many of his advisors said, you must call the Estates General. Louis had a natural reluctance to do so, and he was probably wise in that regard because everything that followed was due to the convocation of the Estates General, which was announced in late 1788 to be to meet at Versailles in May of 1789. When the Estates first met, the three Estates first met, they met separately, as was the custom. Then there was a there was a uh, an occasion around June 20th of, of 89, when the estates were all called together in the same room and there was not enough room for the third estate. So all these good bourgeois in their knee breeches and their dark coats and, and all very respectable showed up. They could not be admitted because there was no room. And they became very upset and stormed off to a local tennis court, a, a large building Tennis courts in those days were enclosed, a large building, and a number of the first estate, the clergy, and a number of the second estate, the aristocracy and the nobility, followed them. Not all, but many from the two higher estates followed the third estate to the tennis court, and there they swore an oath. This is in this famous painting called The Oath of the Tennis Court. And they swore that they would remain there and they would continue in session until a constitution was created. A constitution, this was a novel idea in France. We had absolute monarchy where the king appointed his ministers and was answerable to no one but God as to how well or badly he ruled the kingdom. That was absolute monarchy. And the third estate said, and with the others agreeing with it, said, we will continue to meet until we have a constitution that defines the role of the king and the people and the people's representatives. This is a revolutionary, uh, a revolutionary development. Back to the Palais Royal, a lot of ferment continued there in, in Paris and starting around July 12th, same year, 89, a fellow by the name of De Moulin, uh, who was uh, an aristocrat, uh, was meeting with some of his fellow believers in, in, a, in an expanded government. And uh, he said, in effect, that the Bastille, this great, dark, heavy prison that the French kings used when they condemned somebody with a letter de cachet, uh, condemned them to uh, imprisonment, he, Desmoulins organized an attack on the Bastille on the 14th of July, and that is still commemorated today, 14 de Juillet, as the great uh, symbol of French independence, the great independence day for France, such a, as much as July 4th is for us. The Bastille fell quickly. There were almost no prisoners left. 
there were only guards and, and the uh, governor, as he was called, who, who was in charge of the Bastille. And uh, today, when you go to Paris, as some of you know, uh, there's a column in the Place de la Bastille, uh, which commemorates this awful foreboding prison that lay there uh, for many centuries. So there was the oath of the tennis court, followed by the fold of the Bastille. And then on one night, while the, the, uh, the uh, legislative assembly, as they now call themselves, remember the three estates had decided they would meet together and continuously, and the first thing they call themselves is the legislative assembly. The legislative assembly on the night of August 4th, same year, in a perfect fit of sensibilité, decided that they would renounce all feudal privileges. So here were lords, and on behalf of their ladies, on behalf of their children and their heirs, were resigning their titles. I'm Lord so-and-so, from this day forward, I am citizen so-and-so. I have no titles, I have no feudal rights, I'm renouncing all of them. It's a perfect fit, fit of, as I say, sensibilité, where the, the different uh, participants were trying to outrival each other in how much they could give up. Giving up titles, giving up uh, income, this, this, this really hurt, this wasn't just that you were sir this uh, or lord that. You were giving up titles uh, and, and rights to property which generated income. That was serious business, but they did it. And so, so far the revolution is proceeding from the tennis court to the fall of the Bastille to this resignation of all feudal uh, emoluments and, and duties. And so the summer of 1789 is seen as a glorious time of, of true revolution and the establishment of the formerly absolute French monarchy as a now a limited monarchy. It wasn't completely established that way yet, but it was clear that Louis's days as an absolute monarch were numbered because he was no longer absolute. And this was embodied in what happened in early October when a mob assembled and headed for, a Paris mob assembled and headed for Versailles. Lafayette, Marquis de Lafayette, who was this great American, to us American hero in our revolution, was in charge of what was called the National Guard at that time. And he raced, literally raced uh, on his horse and with the other National Guard members to get ahead of this mob because he could see they were heading for Versailles and they were going to be up to no good. It was a very close call in, in Versailles because uh, there was uh, a number of, there were tendencies toward riot that evening at Versailles. Finally, in the, in the early hours of the next day, Lafayette persuaded the king that the best thing to do would be for the king and his family to return to Paris. So Versailles, which had been the home of French kings ever since Louis XIV in, say, the 1670s, now, a little more than 100 years later, was suddenly vacant. The king and his family and his entourage and everything moved back to Paris. They were established in very fitting quarters in the Tuileries, um, but they were back in Paris where they could be very much at the beck and call of, of the mob and anyone else who had designs on them. So the, the, the summer of 1789, which seemed to start so gloriously, already had become a bit darker uh, by October. The succeeding two years were uh, examples of a gradual deterioration, some of which we'll get into in a little bit, but there were also some, some, some highlights of those years. In 1790, the very next year, uh, Lafayette, again, presided over what was called uh, la fête de la Fédération, 
uh, which was a great display of unity in Paris on what is still called the Champ de Mar on the left bank near where the Eiffel Tower is, is today. And the citizens of Paris all turned out en masse to uh, prepare the ground for this great celebration, which consisted of uh, Lafayette uh, leading the crowd in, in a pledge of, of loyalty to, to federation, to coming together, and, uh, and to the rights of man. The, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen was, was uh, composed in that year of 1790. And this was a, a great display, again, of sensibilité uh, in, in, in that setting. The following year, uh, in 1791, Louis, who was a, a very interesting character and in many ways comparable to Nicholas II of Russia, whom we will meet in the next talk on the Russian Revolution, was a man of, of fixed views, but interesting tendencies toward flexibility. So he could be persuaded on occasion, and then other times he'd just get his back up and decide, no, beyond this I cannot go. Th throughout the rising anarchy and all the uh, incredible developments of 1789 and 1790, his queen, Marie Antoinette, and other nobles were saying, we should flee. Louis, your throne is ultimately in danger, and you need to flee the country, get beyond the borders of France, ally yourself with the other monarchs of Europe, the German princes of Austria, still ruled by Marie, Maria Theresa, the mother of Marie Antoinette. The, the Empress, uh, Maria Theresa was the Empress of Austria. And he was being urged to flee France and get with his people, the other nobles, and uh, that way he would save his throne and he would save his life. So in the spring of 1791, he agreed, and they had this very complicated plot for the king to escape and he was, he and Marie Antoinette and uh, the, the young Dauphin, the, the heir to the throne, were in this, in one of several carriages, and they almost made it. They stopped at the town of Varennes, which is, is uh, very near the, that, the border of France at that time, and they stopped to uh, rest themselves in Varennes, and a soldier there in that town who had been at Versailles in uh, October of 1789 when the king was under great pressure from this mob that, and, and rescued by Lafayette, a soldier who had been there recognized the king. Uh, remember, there was not anywhere near the degree of personal encountering of nobles and, and, uh, and the monarch in, in those days. I mean, they, they, they might be pictured on medals, they might be pictured on engravings, but always in flattering terms. But here was the, the king in the flesh with his wife and child in the carriage, and this soldier recognized him, and, and he, he gathered a number of others, and they stopped the carriage and, and sent uh, messengers back to Paris to say, we think we have the king, we think he's trying to escape, what should we do? Meantime, we're holding him here. They kept him for a whole day in Varennes. The message came back, the king should not be let go, he should be brought back to, Car to Paris. And so the king's effort to flee came within literally a dozen miles of the French border, but he was stopped and returned to Paris. From this point forward, from the spring of 1791, Louis was really the captive of, of, the, of Paris, of, of the bourgeoisie and, and the Paris mob. Also in 1790, there began the formation of what the French called clubs. 
organizations, factions. One of the first to be founded was a club of 1789, and that consisted of a number of, of uh, more well-to-do bourgeois, also uh, nobles like uh, Talleyrand, who was actually the Bishop of Autun, but, uh, and, and certainly was of, of noble birth. And that club was, was, you would say today, it was a small L liberal club. It was moderate. It was looking toward a constitutional monarchy, a king, yes, but governed by a constitution with a legislature to whom he had to answer and, and all those good, moderate things. There were other clubs, the Cordelier Club, which didn't last too long. Uh, there were the Jacobins, the Jacobins who were meeting in an, in an old uh, convent, I believe, uh, that had belonged to a Jacobin order, religious order. And so the, this group of much more radical individuals, like Danton and Robespierre, whom we will meet later, uh, formed the Jacobin Club, and they became increasingly radical. There were other factions that were forming. Uh, the, uh, there was a group called Les Enrangés, the Angry Ones. And they really, in, within a, a few years, by 1793, by 1794, uh, it was just a, a mob bent upon destruction, bent upon uh, taking the life of, of anyone they regarded as, as an enemy. And then there were the sans-culottes. The sans-culottes basically were the mob of, of Paris. And sans culotte, let's be clear, does not mean without pants. <laughs> it means without breeches, without the, the breeches which were buckled just below the knee uh, and made of very fine fabric that the aristos and the nobility wore. Uh, whereas the working men of Paris wore what were then called pantaloons, pants, uh, leggings down to the, to the shoe top which was a fashion becoming more, uh, becoming increasingly worn by some bourgeois as well, not just working men, but bourgeois saw the example, the, the uh, advantages of this more modern dress. But the sans-culottes were earlier, early on designated in, in that way, and they've become famous or infamous in history as uh, the driving force behind this roiling, ever-changing mob that uh, infested Paris uh, at, at the time. Interestingly, and in getting back to America, we're talking about the years 1790 and 1791, and what was happening in America was the very same thing, i.e. the definition of political interest in parties, what we now today call parties, but at the time, Americans like Washington and Madison called them factions, and the French also regarded the, the, the French, uh, the learned scholarly French, uh, regarded them also as factions. The interesting belief that united Americans of a certain class and Frenchmen of a certain class at the time was, we are all the same. We basically have the same interest, which is this generally abstract interest in the welfare of the country. And therefore, being of good mind and good intentions toward the entire populace, there should be no reason why we should be divided. And so Washington and Madison, Hamilton to a certain extent in this country, had a very, in this sense, naive view. Uh, basically, what I think you can say is that when you begin to open the franchise, when you begin to expand the extent to which people can participate in their affairs and govern themselves or begin to govern themselves, you begin to see factions arise. And why is this? This is because, which is something many of these people hadn't thought about as, as learned as they were, what this exposes is that there are different interests 
in the populace. Even if we've all gone to the same schools, even if we have the same general income level, even if uh, our lineage, our lineages are very much similar, uh, it turns out we have different interests. And these interests naturally resolve themselves at the political level into to political parties. This was not foreseen in France. It wasn't foreseen in this country. It was very clear in this country by, by 1792 that there were two parties. There was a Federalist Party. This was Washington and Adams and, and generally the administration. And there was an Anti-Federalist Party, basically led by Jefferson and Madison. And the, the thing that started it in this country was the move by Hamilton to create a bank. And this was regarded as anathema by Jefferson and Madison because what, what this said was that pretty soon the economy is going to be taken over by these people called bankers who have no other interest than making money. And they take money from other people and then they use that money to influence the political structure. This, in their view, was, was evil, in Jefferson's view. Um, but at the same time as this is happening in America, it's happening in France. Only in, in France, they were being called clubs like the Jacobins, the Girondins, and other factions, but the same phenomenon. And, and to my way of thinking, it's directly traceable to the expansion of uh, political involvement. Very interesting uh, development there. So what we have in the, these few short years was this very quick transition from absolute monarchy, going back particularly to Louis XIV, just a century or so before, extending to Louis XVI, absolute monarchy, to the idea of a limited monarchy, or what's called a constitutional monarchy. That is to say, yes, we have a king, we have royal succession, but the king must be answerable to a parliament. The parliament is, is elected uh, by the people. Stunning revolutionary thought. And then very soon after that, by 1792, the idea of a republic. This is what America was, but the French moved very quickly to a republic, which is to say all men are equal, we have no monarchy anymore. We have a government that's defined by a constitution. And uh, republic literally means that the form of government is chosen by the people. This was a very quick transition. In two to three years, the French moved very quickly across this, this spectrum uh, to that of a republic. What was also happening in this tumultuous year of, of 1792 were several contradictory and churning forces. First, in, in August, the Republic was declared. It later became the First Republic, because there were a number of successive republics in France. Uh, but the First Republic was declared in, order, in August, and Louis Bourbon became citizen Capet. At the same time, beyond the French borders, the uh, nobles in, in other parts of Europe, among the German princes, among the Austrians, uh, certainly the English, uh, they were muttering ever more vocally about the need to repress this revolution in France. This revolution threatened all monarchies. The minute you say, the people can decide who shall rule them, and we have decided we don't want this royal lineage anymore, that's a pretty astounding thought, and the crowned heads of Europe could not permit that thought to uh, gain any credence. So the armies of the other monarchs in Europe began gathering on the borders, and the, the French 
the, the bourgeoisie, the clubs, the Jacobins, uh, began to be very alarmed that they were going to be overtaken and crushed uh, by these armies of foreigners. So they instituted what was called the levée en masse, in effect a draft which said every able-bodied male is going to go to the front. There was no organization, uh, there was hardly any effort to train these men, but the, it was a, uh, a giant, all-inclusive draft that sent men to the front. And the cry was, the fatherland is in danger. The fatherland is endangered, and we must get to the frontiers and repel the attacks by these people who just want to reimpose the old regime upon us. And so there were two remarkable battles. Uh, in, first in September at Valny, which is within the French borders, and then the second battle in November at Jemap, which is uh, a location in Belgium, present-day Belgium, where this levée en masse was victorious against these organized armies. This was a thrilling, dramatic development uh, that this citizens, the populace, could rally and, and stream to the front, take on these organized armies and defeat them. It was a, it was a staggering development and it, it gave great uh, impetus to the sense of, of the French Republic. There was some marvelous music that came out of all this. There was a, a song called Sa Ira, which was a favorite marching and rallying song of the French for, for several generations. But it was joined by what has become the French national anthem, La Marseillaise. Uh, La Marseillaise was not written or initially sung by people from Marseille. It was written in one night in a town called Strasbourg, which is in Alsace, one of the eastern provinces near Germany. And in Strasbourg, one night, this composer, his name escapes me at the moment, wrote this song in one night and it began to be sung the next day. And later, troops from Marseille were heard to be singing this new song. And uh, so the people who heard it decided that Les Marseillais were, uh, had composed the song, and so that's how it got its name. But there was a great upwelling of uh, the common feeling of being French and being triumphant over these uh, forces, these reaction forces that were attempting to restore uh, the old regime. There were also excesses in this, this year. Uh, the revolution became total under uh, the need to uh, rally everyone to the common threats. But more than that, as in any situation where uh, a people believe that they are threatened from the outside, there is this uh, need to find scapegoats, there's a need to find and, and remove enemies, and this certainly occurred in, in Paris. In September of that year, 1792, there was an extraordinary, awful series of, of uh, what can you call them except mob murders, where the, some of the prisons, which were holding basically uh, some nobles, some aristos, uh, some even high bourgeoisie, uh, mobs broke into these prisons dragged the prisoners out and, and they were slaughtered uh, by the mobs outside. It was a horrific scene uh, and it continued virtually for the whole month of, of September in, in 92. One of the great excesses. Price controls were established uh, whereby the price of bread, which was the all important price point in the uh, French, in French society at that time, and the, the price of bread had risen four, five, almost ten times over the course of the several years. So price controls were established, and so as I say, the the revolution became total, and the war became 
total. Also, the king became a threat. And in November of 1792, the king was indicted. The Legislative Assembly, which now called itself the Constituent Assembly, was still trying to write a constitution. The Constituent Assembly uh, drew up a bill of, bill of particulars against the king, i.e. he had fostered disunion, he had conspired with other crowned heads to, to uh, destroy the Republic. He was accused of all sorts of sins, almost none of which were true, but it was a lengthy bill of particulars and uh, a delegation called uh, on him and the Tuileries in November and said, we're reading to you this, this bill of particulars and uh, you have to answer. Uh, the king tried to answer. Uh, he retained lawyers and they argued in the Constituent Assembly against uh, the ultimate sanction being given to the king, i.e. death, um, but to no avail. And there were several nights of voting uh, prior to uh, or during the middle of January. And finally, uh, the Constituent Assembly decided by by a series of votes that were actually recorded. This was unusual for the Constituent Assembly because in most cases, uh, votes were uh, taken by acclaim and uh, the, the louder voices passed a measure. This time they had recorded votes and they voted that the king should die. And meantime, a, uh, a general woman by the name of Guillotin uh, had invented a new machine uh, several years before that was thought to be a much more merciful way of execution uh, than beheading or hanging or, or some of the, the means then in use uh, to execute criminals. And he invented the guillotine. And this became very quickly the instrument of death uh, within the new French Republic. And first it was used on criminals, but very quickly it became the instrument whereby the, the mob and the constituent assembly uh, got rid of its, its, of its enemies. So the king was brought, uh, brought to the scaffold uh, in, in January of 1793. And the, the last indignity uh, the man not only had his hands tied behind him and his, and his jacket taken off and, and just standing there in his shirt and his britches, uh, but he wanted last words. It was very important in those days, and we know this from, from the executions engendered by Henry VIII and, and other English kings. It was very important that the person about to lose his life spoke some eloquent words, some lasting words, maybe even only of forgiveness. But it was important that he be allowed a last statement. And Louis was about to make a last statement, and the fellow who was in charge of this macabre uh, extravagance uh, signaled to the drummer. And the drummer beat a tattoo, a very loud tattoo, and drowned out whatever Louis's words were. And so he was executed. And regicide, the killing of a king, is a very serious business. These days, we don't have that many kings left. But in those days, it was a, an enormous, notorious, infamous signal of what was going on in, in any society. At the same time, this, this was January of 93, in the spring of 93, a whole province in, in the west of, of France by, called La Vendée arose in uh, rebellion against Paris. Uh, they were a more traditional people, the Vendéans, and they didn't like what was going on in Paris. They didn't like the execution of the king. They didn't like the, all this business about liberty and the republic all this nonsense in their view, and so they rose in revolt. And it took maybe a year for the central government, the Constituent Assembly, to repress the revolt in the Vendée. 
but it was a very bloody affair and greatly affected the whole atmosphere throughout France. Um, the, the central government, the constituent assembly was putting about the story that even though we killed the king, there are still all these other enemies among us that have to be extirpated. And then there is La Vendée, where these people are resisting and rebelling against good, uh, clear-eyed Republican Frenchmen, and therefore we have to have the most extreme measures against the uh, Vendeans, and, and they did. So the repression of the revolt in La Vendée was, was brutal, and it took about a year and clearly raised the political temperature uh, throughout the country. One of the uh, interesting developments about the revolution was the uh, creation of the revolutionary calendar. So this, this calendar that had come down to us from Roman times with occasional changes of when the first of the year was to occur. The Romans originally had the first of the year occurring in, in March, what we now call March. Uh, March named for Mars, the god of, of war in the, uh, in the Roman panoply. Uh, the, the French invented their revolutionary calendar, which again, was an exercise in rationality. So the year started in September, and as you can see from this chart, uh, followed the zodiac. And so the, the first month of the new year was what we now call September, they called it Vandemau, uh, and it was the month of harvest. And then the, the, net, the successive months were named in terms of their climatological uh, uh, nature. Uh, a month of fog and a month of cold and a month of sleet and, and all those things. And then the, the uh, frumeur in the spring and, and all these things. Very rational calendar. It was 12 months of 30 days each. None of this nonsense of one month having 31 days and another month having 29. Forget it. Every month, 30 days. That adds up to 12 times uh, 30 is 360. You're left over with five, or uh, in, in every four years, six days. What do you do? It was a time of, of holiday. So every year at the, at the, uh, at the end of the year in, in August, there were five or six days of, of holiday. But this was not supposed to be just having a good time. The uh, powers that be, that were at the time, decided that it, this time of holiday or relaxation should be given over to good thoughts, to study, to learning more about the nature of our revolution. Uh, in other words, ennobling high-level thoughts. Don't abandon yourself to pleasure just because we've given you five days off. This calendar lasted until the, uh, the end of uh, the Napoleonic regime, uh, so it lasted about, about a, a little more than 20 years. Interesting development. The, uh, what was called the revolutionary razor, the guillotine, continued its, its awful work throughout 1792, 93, and well into 1794. And it was really a means whereby the sans culotte and les enjarrés, enragés, and other interests settled scores. And the toll continued. Marie Antoinette went to the guillotine in the, in the fall of 1793. Uh, a, a great revolutionary hero, Georges Danton, uh, pictured here in the middle. Danton was both a comrade of and a friend of Robespierre, uh, Maximilien Robespierre, uh, but he was an independent man on his, on his own merits and a very thoughtful man, a vigorous man, a man of action, but a man of thought as well. And some of the people against him in the assembly accused him of some financial rinky-dinks uh, 
of a very small nature, but in, in those days, with the guillotine hanging over everybody, uh, the smallest of criticism could quickly escalate into serious charges. And this is what happened with Danton. And Robespierre begged him, because what if, if Danton would only rat out some of his fellows, he was not guilty of any financial improprieties, but some people he knew of had done so. And Robespierre said, turn on those fellows and, and point the finger at them and, and you escape. And Danton said, no, they're my friends uh, and I'm not gonna rat them out. Let the regular processes of justice find out, but I'm not gonna be the one who points the finger. Uh, he was unable to convince the Constituent Assembly and in May uh, he went to the guillotine. Danton was a man, a large man, a very big man, a robust, very active man, and he had a very large head. He had a, his head was somewhat larger than, than the rest of his proportion of body was, but he was also a very strong and vigorous man, and a tall man. Anyway, his, his last words to the executioner before he tasted the revolutionary razor was he said, be sure to hold my head up to the mob. They will enjoy it. No. Uh, the, one of the last fellows to go to the guillotine was Lavoisier. Um, if you remember your high school chemistry, Lavoisier was one of the great uh, movers and shakers in the field of chemistry in the 18th century. We owe a lot of our knowledge of chemistry to Lavoisier. Well, he was aristocratic and he could not escape the guillotine. So he also uh, was put to death in, in that manner. Finally, in July, it all came down to Robespierre. Robespierre, who had been the leader of the Jacobins for several years and, and uh, not only a complete radical, but a, a rather bloody-minded man, when the, when the massacres occurred outside the prisons uh, two years before, uh, he looked upon that with approval and said that's, that's a good thing because we're, we're cleansing, we're cleansing society of a number of its bad elements. Uh, he was a very fastidious man. He was a very punctilious man. He was always perfectly dressed in the old style, the knee breeches and the frock coat and the, the neckwear and all his linen was perfectly, was perfect on every occasion. But he was a bloody-minded radical. And finally, this, this had been going on so long, this had been going on for two years, this parade of enemies being led to the guillotine, thousands of Frenchmen and French women lost their lives to the guillotine. It was finally too much and a faction within the Constituent Assembly arose against Robespierre, accused him of some of the sins that had been, that he had leveled and others had leveled against others like Danton. And he was uh, seized, arrested, and uh, he was sent to the guillotine. His death was almost the last of this horrendous carnage that had been going on for too long. And the, the, the fall off was precipitous, the fall off of, of executions in, uh, in what was called the Place de la, de la Révolution, which is now the Place de la Concorde. So when you go through that great open square in Paris, which is celebrated every year with the with the Tour de France ending there and Champs-Élysées and the Place de la Concorde. Uh, that's where the guillotine was set up. And uh, when the French were celebrating their, the 200th anniversary of their revolution in, in 1989, uh, there was quite a bit of official embarrassment of how are you going to talk about the revolution and liberté, égalité, fraternité, and then how are you going to talk about the guillotine? an embarrassing moment. Anyway, uh, after Robespierre was killed, uh, there was an immediate fall off, and by the autumn, 
another group had taken power, which they, which who called themselves the Directory, and they ruled for several years. Uh, in the name of the French Republic, this was still the French Republic, but these five men were really the rulers of, of France and the absolute rulers of France, as absolute in their rule as was the king a few years before the king whom they had killed. So there's lots of irony in history. It's wonderful that way. Um, Early uh, the next year, uh, there was an effort to overthrow the Constituent Assembly. Uh, and a, a young colonel of, of artillery by, by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte, a Corsican, not a natural born Frenchman, but a Corsican, uh, was in charge of artillery and the directory called upon him. and. Uh, as the mob was gathering around the Constituent Assembly and threatening to go in and, and tear the, the legislators from limb to limb, Napoleon set up his artillery and gave the command to fire. And as Thomas Carlyle, the English historian, said, this whiff of grape shot ended the French Revolution. Thereafter, the directory was in charge, but it wasn't too many years before uh, Napoleon, who had saved them on this, this day, uh, saved them from the mob, Napoleon took power as first consul. This was in 1799. And he later conquered Italy. He defeated the Austrians. He conquered Italy. And within a few years, uh, he declared, first he declared himself first consul on the Roman pattern. And then in 1802, with no one else to crown him, he took the, the royal crown of France and placed it on his own head and called himself Napoleon I, Emperor of France. And so ended the French Revolution. Um, a remarkable chapter, and, and we'll see when we talk about the, the Russian Revolution next time, how ages afterwards, political revolutionaries referred back to the French Revolution, not so much the American Revolution. America had enunciated this great principle, all men are created equal. And then they created a government that functioned with remarkable longevity and stability for, for decades un, until our own civil war. But what was remembered was this tumultuous eruption in the center of Europe that occurred in those few years at the end of the 1780s and the beginning of the 1790s, when a king was overthrown and the people took power. That was the French Revolution. So if there are any questions, let me hear them. The guy sta stabbed in the bathtub was uh, Marat. Uh, he was uh, one of the Aristos, and he was a turbulent man, a, a violent man, uh, a, a highly exercised man, and a writer and a thinker and all that. Uh, but his nemesis was uh, uh, Mademoiselle Caudray, who uh, went to Palais Royal a few days before and she was determined to kill him. She saw him as the embodiment of all evil. This was in 1794, as the embodiment of all evil. And she went to Palais Royal and bought herself a knife and then gained access. And uh, Marat uh, was in the bathtub at the time. He spent a great deal of time in the bathtub. He had a writing table in front of him, hot water, which his servants poured in from time to time. And uh, she gained entrance and, uh, and did him in. <laughs> <laughs>
That's an interesting question. The question is, what is the comparison of any between the uh, rampant killing, the settling of scores in the French Revolution and ISIS today? Um, it's a fascinating question. I, I frankly don't see the comparison. Um, it's, it's, it's facile to say that the difference is strictly that between a belief a, an ideology on the part of ISIS versus the, the political motivation of the French revolutionaries. I think that's, that's too easy. Um, but the, the, the uh, Islamic State people are clearly motivated by a, a warped and extremely old-fashioned, a medieval view of society and the Quran and, and Islam and willing to kill anyone who gets in their way, who fails to observe even the, the formalities of their view of the religion, which not all Muslims themselves observe. So they're a, uh, a reactionary faction, and I suspect they are going to go the way of, of all uh, reactionary factions, which is to say uh, they will soon outlive uh, any any, use, any utility. They have no utility now except to kill people, and they will very soon um, outlive that. Uh, they, will not, they will no longer survive that. What, ex what explains the anti-clerical, anti-religious aspects of the French Revolution. Uh, France, for very long, and predominantly in the form of the first estate, remember the clergy who were essentially the bishops, uh, part of the political leadership of France was the church, the Holy Roman Catholic Church, with the Pope in Rome, but from which the, the French always separated themselves. The, the French clergy always stood a step away from, from the Pope. In the, first, in the first instance, most of the Popes were Italian and therefore the French were a little skeptical of, of their brothers in the cloth. Um, but beyond that, there was this love-hate relationship enduring for centuries between the church on the one hand with this position not only of spiritual leadership, as it was called, but actually physical, political, and material leadership in terms of its impact on, on the court. Uh, remember one of the key ministers of uh, Louis XIV was Cardinal Richelieu, a cardinal of the church, a red hat, but he was a political operator uh, in the century before. So when, when the revolutionary, when the revolution came, it, as with any revolution, it released a number of forces that may have been latent in society, but suddenly burst forth. Remember, a, a number of the constraints that normally guided a society in monarchical times, when there were clear orders, and wherever you were in society, you knew your place. And there were real strictures if you sought to step out of your place, particularly if you were the third estate or a peasant. Uh, but with the revolution, all of these were released. And men were talking about all men are created equal. And yet here were these clerics still exercising great power and accumulating wealth. If we're talking about the bishops. Uh, Talleyrand was a noble and uh, from a, a, uh, uh, an area of France called Perigord, and uh, he had great personal wealth by virtue of the fact that he was a bishop of the church. Well, this was intolerable. So the combination of, of uh, the experience of many people in terms of the uh, power exercised by clerics and bishops at a local level combined with the philosophy that now all men are created equal, which was a, is, a, is a secular philosophy. 
the church was completely, the, the church, the established church was completely against the idea that suddenly these uh, saint culottes and everyone else could have a say in government. This was intolerable. Um, so that, I think, lay at, at the root of the anti-clericalism, which, which resulted in, in a number of killings of priests and nuns, but nowhere near what the same forces released in Spain in the 1930s, and we'll get to that in, in another several weeks. But there was that same wave of anti-clericalism in, in Spain in our own time earlier in the 20th century. The Declaration of the Rights of Man in, in 1790, following on, on uh, Jefferson's thought of all men are created equal. But what revolution does is, as George Orwell pointed out in, in Animal Farm, uh, Everyone is equal, but some are more equal than others. <laughs> and this is what happens in revolutions because of the dynamic uh, of the revolution itself, itself and the, the complete turmoil. The uh, revolution means overturn, and that's what happened. It's a complete upsetting. It's, it's 52 pickup, the way we used to play that card game. And you're right, so prior to the revolution, there was a hierarchy, and your betters decided what was right for you, the common man, and that continued in the, in the exercise of law, even though officially everyone was the same before the law. Very astute observation. My final point, that is, it has been claimed, it's so much so that it's a cliché today, that the French Revolution was incomplete. Yeah, and in the view even of, of some Frenchmen today, the revolution is still incomplete and has to be carried further, by which I believe is meant a, a greater economic uh, equality and uh, almost close to a, a Marxist a view of, of society. Uh, but there, there is this sense that uh, as excessive and as awful as the revolution was in terms of the loss of life and the, the condemnation of so many really innocent people, uh, as awful as that was, the revolution didn't go all the way through. So what I've listed here is the various forms of government that the French have had since 1789. And you'll see that there are several republics. The French are now being governed by the Fifth Republic, instituted by de Gaulle in 1962. But, uh, and, and there have been several uh, other forms of government. Empire, in, in two situations, first under Napoleon, first empire, and then his nephew, uh, Louis Napoleon III, uh, in the late 18, in the 1860s and ending in 1870, uh, Napoleon III claimed the Second Empire. Um, so there's been a, a lot of ferment and changes in, in French government over the centuries. Uh, and I lay that to this idea of the incompleteness of the French Revolution, that somehow it stalled out under the guillotine and with the help of Napoleon in the 1790s and never really carried through with, with what could be regarded as a, an ordained uh, trajectory which never, never took place. Don't ask me what that ordained trajectory was, but it's, it's clear to me that the revolution uh, didn't run its full course. Whereas the American Revolution with a much more limited set of, of goals, with not so much up in the air as was the, the situation in France,
the you can see that the the Americans were able rather early on to settle on a form of government and, and to keep that and uh, the arguments will rage for as long as there is a France and as long as there is an America uh, why that is so uh, but for the moment you can say that uh, the French Revolution never really ran its full course. Uh, I remember uh, a very interesting talk I heard by a gentleman by the name of Giscard d'Estaing, who was president of France in the, uh, in the early 1980s. And he told how his uh, a progenitor of his, uh, his great-great-great-grandfather was the Admiral Destein, and he went to the guillotine. Uh, and so uh, Giscard Destein was thankful that uh, political resolution was somewhat more moderate in these days and that he did not suffer the same fate as his, <laughs> as his forebear. Uh, but you're, you're right, there, there are still some, some titled names in, in uh, the French establishment, very much so. And, uh, and we in America, I mean, we're supposedly the original Democrats, small d Democrats, right? All men are created equal. Uh, but we love titles as much as anyone. The question is, did the Constituent Assembly ever get around to writing a constitution? And they did. As a matter of fact, they wrote it twice. Uh, there was a constitution in uh, 1791, I believe, and then within a year or so they modified it uh, again. And I believe uh, in this listing of, of the various French regime over the centuries, uh, the, the constitution has been written several more times. And when de Gaulle instituted the Fifth Republic, Again, that was another French constitution uh, redefining the powers of the president. Prior to eight, uh, 1962, the president of France was a figurehead. Uh, he was a, a ceremonial figure. Uh, but now the president of France has real power, uh, and that was owed to de Gaulle and his constitution. <laughs> Thank you so much. Vive la France!